and welcome everyone to our fourth Ecosystem Indicators webinar and thank you for joining us. At each of these webinars I've tried to provide a bit of process orientation during this introduction which I hope isn't getting too tedious for the regular attendees. Uh, this is the fourth of five webinars with the last to be held next Tuesday, February 2nd. The Ecosystem Workgroup will produce a report on this series for the Council's March Briefing Book, which may seem repetitive to those of you who, who have attended all the webinars, but which we hope will orient anyone who has not yet had a chance to listen to the webinars and think about future iterations of the Ecosystem Status Report. The work group is going to meet in Sacramento on March 8th at the start of the Council meeting when we expect to have a more detailed discussion of whether we think the current indicators are useful to the goals of the fishery ecosystem plan, whether they might be tweaked and how much. And uh, the ecosystem work group is hoping that if we get a bunch of work done for the Council in March, everyone else will have a better understanding of where and how to focus their own comments on the ecosystem indicators initiative for June or September. So for today, though, we're going to leave the realm of indicators that may be familiar from past year's reports to consider new ideas and topics on habitat indicators. When the Council began considering this initiative last March, the Council's Habitat Committee asked that we consider habitat indicators during this indicator review process. National Marine Fisheries Service scientists began thinking about how to make that happen, and Dr. Corey Green, a research biologist, with the Northwest Fisheries Science Center's Fish Ecology Division, is here today to present some ideas on the subject. Corey is also a member of the Council's Habitat Committee, so a veteran of the Council process. Following Corey's discussion, we're going to have our usual rambling discussion on how and whether the information he's presented might be useful to the Council's decision making on fisheries management. If there are members of the Habitat Committee participating in today's webinar, the work group is hoping that you'll feel comfortable jumping in with questions to help us get to useful habitat indicators. So with that, uh, Kit, if you would turn the controls over to Corey if you haven't already done so, and we'll let Dr. Green get talking. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> well, thanks for tuning in. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about habitat indicators that have been under development. And for starters, I'd like to acknowledge two people who have been instrumental in developing some of the indicators I'm going to be talking about. Kelly Andrews at the Northwest Fishery Science Center and Allison Collins, who is recently working here and is now working down south at the Metropolitan Water District. I'd also like to acknowledge a number of uh, co-authors who are really instrumental in, in putting together this habitat indicator selection report that was part of the, the, the huge phase three report in 2013. These people um, really helped flesh out the document and um, make it really useful. I've also provided the link to the habitat indicators document because it's maybe a little hard to find on the website, but it turns out here Google really works well. It's the first hit uh, when you type in those keywords I've shown on this um, slide. So as part of this report, we started uh, framing things in, a, in the context of a conceptual model. And so this is shown here. Basically, we've um, put habitat in the context of four macro habitats relevant to the fisheries of the Pacific Coast, freshwater habitats, estuary and nearshore, pelagic and seafloor habitats. And through these, we link ocean climate and ocean drivers, human activities, the species of interest, and then, uh, of course, people. And this conceptual model serves to highlight four reasons why we might want to track habitat indicators independent of other aspects. First, habitats mediate climate effects. So uh, climate and ocean drivers are really useful from thinking about uh, the system at a large spatial scale. But we might um, expect habitat conditions to uh, buffer populations from climate variation, particularly because so few species actually directly are impacted by the climate uh, variables themselves. Secondly, um, habitats mediate effects of human activities. And so in many cases, uh, we think about this from the perspective of non-fishing impacts on habitats and, and through that uh, onto the species themselves. But we can also um, consider other aspects, such as removals by harvest, which sometimes we don't necessarily think about from a habitat perspective, but we know are subject to habitat-dependent gear efficiency. 
A third uh, reason is that habitats mediate food webs. And so this is uh, particularly important in the, con uh, in the context of ecosystem models. We might, might want to incorporate habitat uh, mediation if management and st strategies include habitat conservation. And so fourthly, uh, people share habitat benefits, independence of benefits through uh, the fisheries. Right? In this context, habitat indicators could shed light on where some of these overlaps constitute management constraints versus where they might offer mutual benefits. So uh, we took this, this very general model and then made it a little more specific, focusing on these uh, four specific macro habitats. So here's an example of the estuary near shore uh, conceptual model. And here we uh, thought more carefully about the ocean drivers, the human activities, the species of interest, and the benefits obtained from these habitats. And that helped us develop um, and, and broaden out our selection of indicators specific to um, those macro habitats. And so what I'm going to do is go through the high priority indicators uh, now. Um, that uh, we, we looked at a lot, a lot of, of habitat indicators um, and came up with a much smaller list. And still, this list is pretty long. So it's, uh, this might be one discussion point. So uh, I'm going to go through it by, by macro habitat type. And starting with freshwater, I just wanted to orient you to the list here. So basically, we wanted to uh, highlight indicators of habitat quantity and quality, as well as um, those human activities which might be considered pressures on those habitats. Furthermore, we recognize that for um, because certain measures uh, might be um, might be measurable at, at very specific time scales that are, might not be annually updatable, and because of the large spatial variation in some of these features, that maps might be uh, in some cases better indicators than time series. So we wanted to consider both. With time series, uh, if you have spatial variation, then you can make a map, but the reverse is not true. And so what I've shown here in blue, bold, are those habitat indicators which have currently uh, been under development to, in some shape or form. A lot of these pressures were developed for the phase two report, and so some of these need updating, but at least um, a start has been made. So this is for freshwater, uh, a different for estuary and nearshore, although there um, is at least one overlap. Um, but um, uh, so in addition to river discharge, we're really interested in submerged aquatic vegetation, such as seagrass and kelp, and also um, some of the, the nutrients in these environments as well. And pelag uh, here's the list for pelagic habitats. Um, and, and so here, um, we have a very dynamic environment. and um, some of the really reflect that with dissolved oxygen and, and euphotic depths, which can vary monthly and temporally and, and annually. And finally, uh, for seafloor, so for the, the group that worked on the seafloor habitat indicators, we recognize that there are many fewer potential indicators, mostly because of some constraints on the information. The seafloor is not well known and has not been studied for as long as a period of time. And so we, we don't have as many uh, indicators with, with good data. But uh, here we recognize several, at least. And the ones were, that are under development are shown in blue, dissolved oxygen, and what I'm going to be showing today, which is the disturbance from fishing gear. The indicator process also highlighted indicator gaps. So basically, these were measures which had strong scientific support, but were lacking one way or another in terms of data characteristics. And um, so these. Uh, serve a to perhaps um, encourage people to think about these for um, for future research efforts, and also to think about people uh, looking for historical data sets as well. So with that, I'm I'm going to move into um, some of the uh, more recent work focused on. Um, some these indicator development, and so I, I would like to stop and ask if there's any questions on the indicator selection process. Uh, I don't see any hands raised, Corey. Um, okay. So I think you can see. Okay, I'll move on then. So from the get-go, 
we recognize that uh, habitats are by nature spatial. And so we wanted to be able to capture the spatial variation. And so the, the first thing we did was to try to come up with a spatial framework, a hierarchical spatial framework um, that worked for these different macrohabitat types. And so for marine waters, there's um, it's a fairly straightforward delineation into four ecoregions shown on that map there. Basically, the Sailor Sea, the northwest coast um, with, a, with a break point somewhere between Cape Blanco and Cape Mendocino, the uh, central coast, and then the Southern California Bight. Uh, within those, we can specify smaller spatial scales that are relevant to ecoprocesses. So, uh, Estuaries are naturally defined by watershed topographic breaks, and we sort of distinguish those within the context of the watershed and also from um, head of tide to their uh, marine shoreline. Uh, in the near shore, we are um, looking at the photic zone, the water column in Benthos and the photic zone, which is basically the um, uh, de down to about uh, 40 to 50 meters depth, and uh, latitudinally, the coast is divided into littoral drift cells, which describe longshore uh, transport processes. Plagic uh, environment is much more dynamic. Um, here, it's much more large, larger too. So we're looking at the um, water column from the near shore zone to out to the EEZ, and uh, within that. Uh, we're breaking it uh, into bath symmetry breaks, such as uh, on shelf and off shelf, and water column breaks, such as epipelagic and mesopelagic zones. And finally, with the seafloor, um, that's the benthos from the near uh, the near shore edge to the EEZ. Here, there's uh, been a long history of developing a spatial framework via uh, physiological, physiographic traits, and so um, a couple examples is, is bathymetry and substrate. All right, so I'm going to be talking about a couple of freshwater indicators that have been under recent development. And so this is the habitat-based space framework for freshwater. Here we've divided uh, the California current region into six freshwater ecoregions based on this um, biogeographical analysis table at all. And um, as you can see by that map there, it, there's some fair, fairly, fairly good similarities between that um, and the marine uh, ecoregions, with the exception that we've added in a couple large river systems uh, separate from others, so the Sacramento-San Joaquin system, and then two ecoregions for the Columbia systems. And so what we've been able to do now is, is summarize data for at both sort of the scale of the entire California current here and for these uh, six different ecoregions. So the first, um, oh yeah, and within, within each uh, ecoregion, we, fur we further subdivided data into hi um, hydrologic units. And so there's, there's multiple types of hydrologic units. Um, and so we've chosen eight field hucks. This represents sort of a middle ground between um, two coarse scale and uh, two fine scale and represents ecological processes fairly well. Hey, Corey, sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. Acronym warning. What does HUC stand for again, please? Uh, it's um, hydrologic unit classification. Thank you. Totally marine person. No, I understand. <laughs> so the um, first indicator we've developed is the snow water equivalent indicator. Toby talked about it briefly in, in his webinar, but I wanted to touch base on it as well. Um, so as we know, uh, snow, snow is really important for uh, returning uh, salmon. And, uh, and modulates their temperature as they're migrating upstream. Furthermore, during uh, freshwater rearing phases, those fish which over, um, rear in freshwater for over a year are highly dependent upon stream temperatures, and snow melt is really important for that. We also um, are acutely aware that snow melt is a critical natural reservoir for storing water for people. And so, um, as shown in that picture up in the of, of Mount Shasta during this last year. Um, we had huge losses of snow melt from some of our high, higher systems. And so we can uh, summarize data based on, on two data sets, snow tell stations and then um, an additional state monitoring effort within California um, into this uh, typical um, plot you've seen for trend analysis and um, for IEA indicators. And just 
So people, in case there's some newcomers to these webinars, I just wanted to go over these um, these types of graphs. What we have in the dark green, um, the dashed line indicates the long-term average. Those um, solid lines indicate the standard deviation of the long-term average. Um, where we have annual data, uh, we can calculate an annual standard deviation that's in the gray. And then um, over on the uh, right side is a green box. And so the um, trend line within that is specified by that arrow there, it's the five-year trend, and then um, the dot underneath specifies the five-year average compared to the long-term average. So if the five-year average was one standard deviation below or above of the long-term, then that dot would be then a minus or a positive, respectively. And so what, what we have here is, is the, um, the weighted uh, April 1st snow water equivalent anomaly. So it's weighted by the um, area of the different ecoregions, and it's the 1st of April. That's the typical time in which you sort of got a maximum extent of snow water, and, and it starts declining from there. And so that's why people measure it at April 1st. Uh, if you look at the graph, there's a couple obvious, things, obvious patterns that pop out. The first pattern is with respect to the recent five-year trend, very, very sharp downward decline, and 2015 was the lowest we have on record for the entire t California current. But the other thing that really pops out is this, um, is this apparent change in the variance as you go from 1915 to 1965 and then further on to recent periods of time. And that's where breaking things down in a spatial context is important. It turns out all that uh, historical data, most of that is from the Sacramento-San Joaquin systems and some of these north, northern California sites. And so um, when, you, when you do break it down sub-regionally, um, the data make a lot more sense. The, the variation seems about um, similar across the entire region. Um, so here, when you break it down, some other interesting patterns emerge. So 2015 was the lowest year in record for all um, ecoregions within the California current, and um, all experience this five-year decline. Uh, it's worth pointing out as well that uh, one system, the Oregon and Northern California site, that um, those recent five years basically are much lower than the historical average. And so um, it's worth asking um, how things are doing this year. There's been a lot of press about increasing snowpack recently, and that's borne out in this, this uh, map. This is another possible way to present data. Um, and you can see uh, stark changes uh, in what was uh, around in uh, last year, this time, time versus now. And um, so the darker colors indicate higher um, snowpack. And you can see easily the Olympic Peninsula. Um, Northern California and the Sierra Nevada all show a much greater extent of snowpack this year compared to last year. Um, but that re it remains to be seen how that'll pan out for the measurement we'd want, which is this April 1st measure. That's, again, the maximum level of snowpack. And we, we, we can expect a fair amount of variation uh, over that period of time. Um, it, January snowpack is not predictive of April snowpack, primarily because you, you can have a lot of warming in between those. And there's already uh, records in, um, in January showing that um, this, this is going to be a pretty warm January. So it remains to be seen how snowpack pans out for the summer. So moving on to stream flow indicators. So stream flow is obviously important to fish. You can't have fish without water. and um, uh, what we've done is, is noted that, well, you'd want to pay attention to both ends of the spectrum. Too much water or too little water are both bad things for fish as well as for um, people's communities. And so we'd want to track both. And so this um, graph shows the overall pattern based on 213 USGS gauges uh, with at least 30 years record. And um, so the overall patterns both show this recent decline, although the um, most recent year, 2015, is not necessarily the, the lowest year on record, unlike snowmelt. It's also worth pointing out that these gauges include both regulated systems and unregulated systems. A regulated system is one controlled by a dam, and, and so the um, flow 
measurement reflects um, people's use in addition to the natural flow patterns. So let's go. Uh, I'm going to start with the maximum flow and break that down a little bit. So here are the um, uh, one-day maximum um, flow anomalies across ecoregions. And so uh, there's a fair amount of variation across these uh, systems, but there's one general trend, and that's in the more interior systems, such as the Colombian Sacramento San Joaquin. They all showed a negative trend in the recent five years, whereas um, elsewhere, um, that was not a, uh, on the more coastal sites up north, that was not the case. Um, and then Southern California stands out as sort of a very sort of sharp decline, flattening out. Then we can, um, the seven-day minimum was uh, a fair bit different. Uh, again, many sites showed this negative decline. Uh, in fact, all of them did except the Southern California bite, and that, that's pretty much flat because many of these systems go dry in the summer, and so they have a low, a low flow that is, is pretty much uh, non-variant over much of the time series. So that's uh, the, the flow indicators that we've developed. We really uh, started with uh, freshwater flow uh, for two reasons. One was that there hadn't been much of attention to the freshwater systems within the California current IEA. And secondly, because uh, the data were so readily accessible with snow tail sites and the USGS gauges. So we are moving on to um, these other environments, particularly pelagic waters and seafloor, um, where we have uh, indicators under development, and this year we were, we've, there's going to be a lot of talk about fish EFH, so it's worth uh, looking at more detail and uh, one particular indicator that has been under development for a while, and that's this disturbance from fishing gear. And so uh, here are shown uh, patterns for the entire California current. Um, so basically this includes both trawl and fixed gear and is uh, based on um, data from the NOAA observer program. And so we, over this entire time series, we see a, a general decline. And um, at least at the scale of the entire California current, there's uh, a strong um, negative pattern within the last five years. Uh, note, of course, that this is uh, the, the, the most recent five years are not uh, up to 2015. Kelly Andrews is, is working on updating that. And it probably won't be in um, the report. Um, but uh, definitely trying to update it so that it, it, it can be um, updated on an annual basis. So let's uh, break this down into the four marine ecoregions. And, um, oh, sorry, the, uh, break these down into the physiographic types. And so here I'm differentiating these uh, based on shelf, upper slope, and lower slope, and hard and soft sediments. And I thought this was uh, a really interesting um, uh, display of, of how things might differ at smaller spatial scales. Um, and so you can see that there is an, um, some negative trends in distance disturbed, um, but they're particularly strong in the most recent years for the shelf and, um, uh, shelf and upper slope for soft bottom habitats. Um, overall, though, these, there's, there's long-term trends mostly in the, in, in the shelf sites. And what seems to be the case is more recently that um, that effort has uh, has um, moved from the shelf to the upper slopes. Another thing uh, to look at carefully is that um, you'll see that the axes differ quite a bit as you go um, from shelf, uh, from hard to soft, and within soft, the upper slope in particular shows a huge amount of, of variation and effort, and even this most recent year, which is pretty much the low of the entire time series, that's still more than the other uh, graphs combined. So those are the indicators that I wanted to highlight now. Uh, we're, we're not done by any means, and, and we're really just getting started. And so some uh, elements that are really on our, our near horizon, we want to focus on uh, additional climate-sensitive habitat indicators. In particular, there's some really good recent dissolved oxygen data sets coming online. And so while uh, they don't have a long time series, they still represent um, a really good spatial coverage. And, and so um, I hope to be working uh, with the, um, the ground fish survey crew, which has these ga gauges uh, on for every uh, trial that they do now. 
Uh, we're also interested in mapping coastal systems sensitive to sea level rise. There's been a fair amount of effort going into that, and there's some, now some recent updates to the base um, the base maps of um, estuaries in those places. So th those will um, help um, delineate with finer resolution these um, sensitivity to sea level rise. We also want to put a lot of these human activities, which were uh, synthesized previously, especially in the phase two report, uh, we want to put those in more of a spatial context. So whereas you might have these one lines as, as um, shown in those report, we hopefully will have more for developing either physiographic or, um, or eco-regional based um, trends. And, and finally, uh, high on the list for estuary and nearshore environments are time series and maps for submerged aquatic vegetation, such as eelgrass and kelp. And so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Corey. Um, Kit, I wanted to note that I'd gotten an email from Fran Recht, who said that she had tried to raise her hand about an estuary question. So as we're starting off the Q&A session, maybe uh, you could unmute Fran and let her ask her question. Can yeah, you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Thank I you. Hear you. Thanks, Corey. Uh, good presentation. I had a question about um, why or could the, um, why not or, or could we still use the amount of estuarine or a tidal wetlands loss um, as one of the indicators? Yeah, that's a good question. So really that depends on our ability to measure that over time or whether we, we just want to have sort of a, a starting point from, a, from what we know from maps. And so there are several time periods in which we might be able to estimate that. So there have been uh, historically um, uh, some mapping efforts that, uh, that could go into a measurement. Those are based on sort of late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, from there, um, we don't have much information on particular habitat loss until um, sort of more recent time periods where GIS data sets have been um, constructed. And so um, as you're well aware, that's, that's um, of high interest um, to incorporate in, into the work that um, people are doing through the Pacific Marine and Estuarine Fish Habitat Partnership. Thank you. I see that um, Fred Junick has his hand raised, but um, it's showing, Fred, you need to enter a, your audio pin um, to be able to um, participate. So if you do that, I could uh, make sure you're unmuted. While we're waiting for Fred, does anyone from the Ecosystem Work Group have any questions? Uh, this is Deb. I did have one question um, that had to do with uh, your figures looking at, um, uh, I think it was bottom disturbance and combining the gears. And I yeah. was curious, it sounded like it, it included trawl gear as well as maybe trap and line gear. Is that correct? It's, yeah, it's um, bottom gear and fixed gear. So how do you measure distance disturbed with fixed gear? Uh, well, I would turn to Kelly Andrews if he's on the phone and he can go through that. Kelly, do you want to comment? Okay, Hello? Kelly, you're off. You're unmuted. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so let's see, the question was, how do you measure fixed gear disturbance? 
And what we've done with uh, just the figures that you see on the screen there is that the distance between set and retrieval points is basically the distance that was used. So just like in a trawl, um, if you measure the distance between the start and end points, it's basically the same idea is start with the set point and end with the, the retrieval point. And that's, so that's, that's how they were measured. So for most of that data, um, moving forward, um, the fixed gear observation data is, is not as good as the, the trawling data. And so likely going forward, uh, we'll probably reduce this and just use the trawling uh, data. And the goal is to put this more into a, a spatial framework, similar to what Corey has just discussed. Um, but make it more of a spatio-temporal indicator where you can uh, see changes in uh, disturbance to the bottom you know, across a map of the entire coast over time. Does that answer your question? <clears throat> yes, thank you. That was helpful. Uh, Larry Gilbertson uh, has his hand up if you want to speak, Larry. Yeah, am I unmuted? Yes. Okay, thank you. Hey, um, I, I guess I'm a little bit lost. Um, the the um, matrix of indicators that you, know, you, you presented, I see the, you know, this great value in each one of them. The thing I'm struggling with is how this whole array of indicators gets plugged into the council process and their, and their decision making. Are you folks thinking in terms of each one of these indicators kind of uh, independently entering the process, or are you looking at maybe integrating some of them to characterize general habitat conditions or ecosystem health or some other such thing that would set stages for council process? Yeah, I, I can let other people comment as well who have presented indicators, but from my own personal perspective, I would say the multiple indicators approach is much more useful than uh, sort of indicator by indicator basis. And so if it's something for like salmon populations where we, where they have defined life stages in freshwater uh, estuaries and marine life stages, for example, uh, we would we would like to have multiple indicators to say, well, what um, what are the conditions in early on um, versus um, sort of uh, when they're more uh, likely to return, and therefore, in that context, we might have a better ability to use them in a uh, management-centric way. Do, Chris Harvey, do you want to comment on uh, sort of the use of multiple indicators? Uh, sure. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. I think. Yeah, I um, can hear you. So yeah, the um, the I guess the the first thing I would just make sure it was clear that um, the, the indicators that Corey presented uh, those ones that were highlighted and boldfaced in blue were the ones that have um, have I believe anyway have uh, uh, passed the highest uh, level of muster in terms of what we believe their their quality and value to be um, so uh, we we definitely aren't looking at all of them uh, per se but uh, but uh, yeah the, the multiple indicator suite is valuable for a couple of different reasons, and you know you could imagine that some of those indicators are extremely valuable uh, for um, looking at the status of habitat or the availability of uh, habitat or the um, the risk faced by, let's say, salmon. Uh, and then others would be very applicable for uh, questions that that were um, um, related to ground fish or highly migratory, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, so having a lot of different indicators there uh, gives us the flexibility to plug into uh, specific questions as they arise in the council process. Uh, we definitely wouldn't, um, you know, uh, want to be um, trying to apply them all simultaneously uh, without uh, without being a little bit more, uh, you know, attuned to what the council is after. But but hopefully uh, hopefully by keeping track of a large number uh, of indicators. Uh, that tell us different things, like Corey just explained, different things about uh, habitat across 
uh, these long complex life history um, strategies of different species uh, were better able to uh, inform the council uh, about this, you know, the, the habitat um, issues that species are facing over their full life histories. And I, and I would um, sort of turn toward the, the concepts uh, brought forth by Bill Peterson's index for thinking about uh, ways in which we could use multi, multiple indicators in a useful way. So they track some 20-odd some indicators uh, that might be inform, informing salmon returns to the Columbia River. And, uh, and so there, they, they have a couple strategies for combining these in a useful way. Um, Fred uh, Juning, um, if you have a question or a comment, please go ahead. Fred, it looks like you're, you've muted on your end, um, so you'll need to unmute if you want to speak on your end. Um, Eric Wilkins, I see your hand is raised. Go ahead. Hi, Corey, can you hear me? I can. Hi, Corey. Um, I had a quick question that um, about the combining of estuaries and nearshore habitat. Can yeah. You, would there be any advantage to looking at them separately, especially in systems that are not connected year-round? Yeah, there's definitely advantages. And, and so when we, I, I combined them, I mostly combined them from a sort of, um, sort of a, a just a simplification for the talk. Um, within the indicator selection uh, report, we do delved into those separately. And so I don't want to say that they're all just sort of mashed in there willy-nilly um, into just one set. But I'd, it's just a sort of a simplification. of These, these are sort of um, habitats you might consider are highly um, coastally affected uh, systems as opposed to some of these other places in marine waters. Okay. Thanks. This is Yvonne. I had a question if there's not other um, hands raised from outside the group. But um, the four ecoregions that you identified, Salish Sea, North Coast, Central Coast, and Southern California Bight, are the, I can't remember, we had some different um, eco-region breakouts in earlier um, webinars, are you using consistently the same eco-regions across all of the IEA analyses? Um, so I guess what you're getting at is where those breaks occur? Well, yes, and I can't remember whether they're the same breaks that, say, Chris and Toby used in their talks or different breaks. And right. Um, it, so it does depend on the classification you look at. Um, so we depended upon one which, which made the distinction at Cape Mendocino. There are certainly others which make the break at Cape Blanco. In short, there's, there's an ecoregional break somewhere between those two. And that could vary on a year-by-year -year basis based on the um, pattern of winds and those things. So um, whereas this shows it as one single line, you'd probably want to think about it more um, as a line with a large confidence interval around it. Yeah, Yvonne, this is Chris. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, Toby and I would certainly uh, concur with Corey on that. And I think um, uh, one of the things that is evolving most in um, in our overall IEA approach uh, is uh, is getting things into more of a spatially discrete uh, framework. And we're going to be uh, depending very heavily on uh, the work that Corey and the rest of the Habitat group is doing uh, to provide kind of the, the guiding light for us on that. Um, you know, it could be that some things will be different depending on if you're looking at more uh, uh, landward versus more seaward um, uh, processes and indicators, but uh, we're definitely going to be taking uh, or following Corey's lead on this. Thanks. I um, 
you know, I always sort of have one eye on the next iteration of the fishery ecosystem plan and what kind of information might be coming out of the IEA that can help us update that. And one of the um, sections of the plan deals with sub-regions within the California current ecosystem off the U.S. West Coast. And so um, it would, if you guys would sort of consider settling on something by March 2018, that would be fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any questions from the Habitat Committee? We've had a couple so far. Uh, Richard Scully has his hand up. Richard? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I, I see you have some information on uh, nutrients uh, over time, but on Pollution, other factors of pollution, such as uh, pharmaceuticals and um, herbicides and pesticides, are there, uh, is there a possibility of having uh, indicators of, the, of those factors as, as uh, through time? That's probably going to have a lot of impact on uh, fish, fish. Yeah, so these... The example you provide is an example of an indicator um, which um, was thought to be important, but which we couldn't find unified data sets across the California current to provide um, sort of these, this broad scale um, assessment um, from an indicator standpoint. And so I, I would agree with you that it's something that would be worth tracking, particularly in fresh water and estuarine systems. And the challenge is to find those data sets um, where we have reliable um, measurements, either over time or, or really well over space. Oh, this is Kelly Andrews again. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Um, yeah, just to add to that, um, in the human activities sections of the IEA, uh, there is an inorganic pollution uh, indicator and an organic pollution indicator that is basically summarized just like this nutrient input um, indicator that you see on the screen now. And uh, the organic pollution indicator is made up of, I believe it's 16 different pesticides that have been measured in streams along or within uh, watersheds that, the, that drain into the California current. So that is Again, it's it's uh, I guess it's coast wide, and that's something that um, we would also like to continue to sort of fit into the spatial framework and get that data into uh, watersheds that then diffuse out into the marine environment and and look at um, anomalies over time, five year means over time, and, and five year trends how how that changes over time. So those are those are sort of three indicators, the nutrient input, organic pollution, and inorganic pollution that sort of have the same, I guess, uh, long-term goal in mind to, to, to get that done as well. And just to add to that, I think in the indicator process where we we're selecting high-priority ones, the, the, that fell as sort of a lower tier one primarily because we have a multitude of watersheds coming into the system and um, there are 16 sites that we have data for. So although we can definitely summarize it and it is going, it is ongoing, um, that didn't appear in the list that you saw before for that reason. Wait, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. I may have been typing too fast. Could you explain that again, please, Corey? Yeah, so we're, I showed a list of priority ind indicators before. There's a, there's a, we included a longer list and, and went through this rigorous indicator selection process. And in, and that, um, in that process, there's, a, of course, a number of criteria. The big criteria that stands out for a lot of these are, are the, the, um, um, the 
data resolution, uh, either in time or in space. And in, in the, the case of that one, it, it got a lower ranking primarily because there's um, 16 sites, not the some um, 100 plus uh, river systems entering the coast. Um, Corey Niles has his hand up. Corey? Yeah, thanks, Kate. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, Corey, thank you. Um, I guess um, I'm wondering, you know, the, uh, as with fisher fisheries oceanography, kind of like the, the end goal in a lot of cases is to link the uh, oceanography to things like survival and recruitment of fish and I think be the similar goal out there for uh, certain habitat characteristics since they directly link to productivity. So is there, has there been, have there been efforts or is it all in the range of possibilities to start linking any of these indicators to, uh, to stock assessments? I think we heard about some salmon stuff on the first call and um, maybe freshwater input. Are those, so yeah, generally is there any, is it in the realm of possibility for these, for these indicators to get linked to, to the stock assessment process? Yeah, there's a there's a lot of interest, and uh, there's um, been certainly some scientific work strongly linking uh, freshwater um, metrics um, to either adult returns or um, the productivity of adult returns, so like a recruits per spawner measure, um, and so that, uh, that's um, been used and started to get used in forecasting, I should say. So some people in um, Puget Sound um, for, for those stocks, which are incorporated into the entire council process, their forecasts are based on, on some of the freshwater indicators, which have shown um, a strong relationship with peak flows. But I, I think um, as a whole, you're going to see that a lot of these, the use of these indicators from a forecasting perspective will, will take a fair amount of time and review to get into the council process. And um, I'm sure that um, all this will be carefully scrutinized by the um, SSC. Corey, yeah. I, uh, oh, pardon me, Deb, did you have a question? Go ahead, Eva. Um, I was wondering, I can see uh, where the habitat disturbance indicator can lead directly into some of the Council's work on essential fish habitat, but uh, can you talk a little bit about whether you think the, oh, the blue bolded indicators you showed at the beginning of your talk will help the Council in its essential fish habitat review processes, and if so, how? Um, well, yeah, so the essential fish habitat question is a little complicated. There's, there's several elements of that. So first is um, sort of delineation for the different fisheries management plans. And so from, uh, from that perspective, uh, essential fish habitat is pretty much the entire California current for something like ground fish. And it's further complicated where you have these groups of species um, um, incorporated into one fisheries management plan, and uh, and you, you of course note that these fish are using different um, different habitat types within those, and so so it's um I would say a not straightforward process by which habitat indicators directly influence EFH designations. There are some capabilities for doing this. So for example, there is are, there are these. Um, HABCs, basically habitat areas of particular concern, and those where we have measurements for those in the habitat indicators process, there's a strong overlap. So for example, something like eelgrass, um, which is a HABC, those, those could be called out as indicators and, and measured over time. And so right now, the um, regional office is, is basing EFH um, and these, these eelgrass sites based on maps, but those maps should be updated and can be updated. Um, so there are there are several um, there's, there's basically a trade-off I would say with the EFH process and sort of the de the, the need to designate large portions of it. Um, I would say in the in, as we move toward the future with an eye toward improving the levels 
um, of EFH from, say, just presence absence of fish to something more like relative densities or something like that, we have the we could conceivably have the capability of better incorporating these habitat indicators. And so um, some of the, the ongoing work that's been done in the ground fish synthesis has pointed in ways toward which we might uh, use some of that information in a habitat-centric way. Are there other questions? Because I yeah. have questions of uh, my own. Oh, good, another one. Yeah, this is Fred Jurek. Uh, can you hear me? I'm, I'm yes, sorry. I can hear you. I've had, yeah, I've had some pro a new cell phone and uh, new to the system. But uh, I don't have a problem with uh, the indicator that you've uh, presented, nor how you've done it. But one of the questions I have is, have you been identifying possible habitat enhancement actions. Uh, ideas, uh, I mean, concerns are, you know, indicators which are positive, which are negative, or which are methods that you can actually improve some of those uh, the indicators. Yeah, that's a really good question. And so much of the efforts going into sort of thinking about habitat indicators, not only sort of uh, from a quantity perspective, but also from those pressures, point toward perhaps management strategies um, that you could do for um, toward habitat conservation. And um, uh, the, obviously those pressures indicators are, are fairly straightforward in that um, sort of the direction you'd want to sort of reverse that with management. Some of the habitat quantity indicators are a little um, perhaps more challenging depending upon which indicator you look at. The ones I showed, for example, though, um, sort of freshwater flow, that's one uh, because that incorporates a lot of these um, regulated rivers is one in which uh, there is conceivably alternate management solutions and one which often comes up in front of the council. Um, uh, the Habitat Committee is, is often reviewing requests uh, for council input uh, for um, preserving uh, e ecologically sustainable river flows during adult salmon returns. Okay. Uh, the, re the, the reason I, I bring that up is, you know, is I, I know that, uh, is, you know, the essential fish habitat uh, concerns are, are being developed right now. And uh, I know, I mean, I have a long history with uh, habitat enhancement in the Central Valley. and. I did run up into you know, against problems actually trying to do habitat enhancement activities because of the defined essential fish habitat. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem the problem was it it, it I, the, the habitat was identified well, but they there was no leeway as to how you could modify. I got you. So an, a habitat enhancement could conceivably be interpreted as sort of an impact to EFH. Correct. Is that what you're getting Correct. at? Yeah. Yes, I am. So this, this brings up, uh, um, I, I'm going to put up a list of questions which I had for um, people listening in, which we, we, we might talk about further. Um, but that um, there's that last one which I thought was potentially interesting, and that would be sort of management-based indicators relevant to EFH. And, and so the regional office tracks um, all the cons consultations they have. Some of these might be relevant in the context of various um, of sort of these um, in the macro habitat context or which ones are specified toward freshwater or estuaries and, and that sort of thing. Um, so I'm just putting that out as one possibility. There's, it would certainly take some effort to work with the regional office to develop sort of these management-based indicators, but they might be telling us something about these, these um, actions that uh, we're taking some, uh, to sort of um, facilitate habitat conservation. Your point is that in some cases some of these might be um, might uh, be uh, challenging to go through. So um, that 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 is certainly an alternative that could be discussed. Eb, do you still have a question or a comment? Yeah, it's kind of both. Um, I'm, I'm glad you put these questions up at the end, I guess, because I, I think the three ways that 
that I think of habitat indicators is they can be ones where uh, it's the fishery affecting the habitat, such as the gear one that you pr provided on disturbance, or it can be the habitat that's affecting the fisheries in some direct or indirect way. Right. And then there's also the habitat effects on non-FMP species, but that may still be related to the FMP species. And so it's kind of a comment, but kind of a question in the sense that have you, um, is part of your consideration where some of these indicators may fall in one of those categories or maybe some other category I'm not even thinking of? Yeah, well, in particular, those first two uh, ring true for a lot of these indicators we came up with. This, um, this third element about, um, I guess, what you'd call ecosystem component indicators um, or, or, or species, I think those are... Uh, so those are best incorporated from the context in which we developed these um, macro habitats. So, for example, estuary systems. There's a there's relatively few species across all FMPs uh, for which we have um, estuarine dependent um, species. So, um, for example, English sole come up, and Chinook salmon certainly are uh, uh, estuaries are important for them. Um, but they, but these estuaries uh, could conceivably be very important for some of these ecosystem component species, and so um, that's why we wanted to have as broad a tent as possible to to capture these habitat types, which might not be directly informing um, the, the commercial fisheries, but are still important. Um, yeah, I'll stop there and, and uh, ask for, look for more discussion on that. Corey, uh, Niles, you have uh, your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Kip, but I, will, uh, I don't want to interrupt the flow there. If anyone had comments on that discussion, I'll, I'll hold off. Um, also, Richard Scully has his hand up. Uh, I'm the same as, as Corey. I have a question from earlier. Corey, then Richard. Oh man, we almost had a discussion going on a webinar. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I have a Corey. Um, so yeah, go. So I was going back before you put your questions up. So. Apologies for interrupting the flow, but I guess uh, you're, I asked a similar question on the last webinar um, about kind of, and you, you mentioned going through the indicator selection process and really ending up with the ones that have the best data sets. So like kind of in your, without trying to sound glib about it, like we're on the spectrum of, of we're measuring everything we would want to measure versus we're only measuring stuff we have data for, <laughs> like how, how where are you on that spectrum? Do you think with these with your your habitat list? Yeah, I mean, so th this was a challenge, uh, especially given that we've got four different habitat types that were, or four to five really, if you include nearshore and estuarine systems that we're we're trying to track. And so already you're asking for a minimum of four to five indicators, maybe, and then you add on sort of these elements with that that you'd want to track habitat quantity, quality, and um, and pressures, and that, that sort of balloons it. And so I guess um, I think this is going to be an ongoing process. We can't show 20 indicators, habitat indicators, every single report for the California current, um, but we do want to track some, some key ones. And, and I think that's, that's uh, the nature of that first question, are, is what, what are the key indicators people do want to tra uh, track um, as as we have these um, reports come out on an annual basis, um, I, I I guess I, I'm of the feeling that it's important to track a number of indicators, but maybe consistently report on a few that really rise to the top of the interest level. Richard, do you want to go ahead? Sure. <clears throat> um, 
you you have the snow water equivalent um, indicator uh, time series, and uh, that that's that's an important part of um, summer river flow, as as you talked about. And in 2015, in the in the Columbia River, um, it, we had an extreme situation where snow water equivalent was low river flows were therefore low, and air and water temperatures were high, uh, we, usually we're concerned about water temperature and spring and summer flows. The, the, the higher the flow, the lower the temperature, the higher the survival of smolts, right. salmon smolts heading to sea. But uh, in 2015, uh, the, the situation was so severe that it began to, that it severely affected adults. Correct. Where yeah. uh, the, the temperature was so high in the river, and uh, of course, for fish to go up as fish, they 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 have to. It's surface water that goes into the fish ladders, and uh, so the sockeye weren't weren't moving up rivers, and uh, summer chinook were slowed down, summer summer steelhead, and uh, so I wonder if there's if if uh, we're maybe moving into a period where we need to find a new um, indicator for these really, really, um, to kind of monitor the severe conditions that are, are affecting survival of an ad fish um, when, when flows and snow water equivalents are very low. Yeah, and there's conceivably um, ways in which we could um, do some effective management in that respect, given that we have pretty extensive hydropowers on some of the, uh, hydropower operations on some of these river systems. Um, and so, um, if, if for example, we have strong evidence of, of warm temperatures or, or extremely low snow melt um, in these environments, um, sort of as we approach uh, um, adult migration, adult returns, it's it's con it's conceivable that um, management strategies such as adding flow into the system. Um, from these hydropower systems um, could be successful. And, and that strategy has been pursued for repeatedly um, by uh, the council in the context of the Klamath River. Hey, Corey, this is Chris Harvey. If I could, if I could uh, maybe ask a follow-up on that. Uh, do uh, do any of the flow indicators that we have right now? Um, do you think they would serve as as reasonably good proxies for whether we're turning a sufficient water and water quality uh, when they return to the streams, or do we need to be identifying another indicator in that case? I think we need to be um, doing some checks on the indicators to see to see how well, for example, correlated some of these metrics are, and. Uh, and how well they might um, might track some of these uh, some of the productivity of the populations we care about. Um, Scott McMullen has his hand up. Uh, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, thank you, Kit. Um, in regard to your third question about how should habitat indicators be vetted, um, I think the ecosystem advisory subpanel would be uh, one one place. And uh, particularly on questions like, for example, when you uh, had information about the fishing impacts, I think it would be helpful to have uh, fishing industry people, maybe from the Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel or, or the EAS, uh, be able to comment on those so that there's a better understanding of what those impacts are. Great. That, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, this is Yvonne, and I, I think, you know, looking at some of your questions, Corey, here at the end, I think they're reasonable. Um, I suspect that the ecosystem work group is probably going to be throwing some questions back at the Habitat Committee in terms of asking the Habitat Committee, you know, what what do you think is useful for your annual work? Um, mm -hmm. Because some of the things like snow melt and whatnot, I, I, I think we're, they're, going to be in the regular physical indicators, but um, 
I think we'll, I can sort of envision habitat indicators, as you said, there's a, there's a bunch of stuff that we can keep track of maybe, but not necessarily have them in the report uh, on an annual basis. So, and there might be things that the different fishery management plans need periodically. So, right. uh, it, it, I think we're just at the start of the discussion on this, at least from the policy end of things. I think that's right. Yeah, um, it it will be really helpful to have your input um, for providing sort of some directions on on how these other bodies should w weigh in on on what indicators um, get tracked either um, through the report or through other means. Okay, do we have any other questions from anyone, members of the public, any advisory body members? Uh, Tom Rudolph has a question. Tom, go ahead. Thanks, Kit. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. All right, cool. Well, uh, thanks, uh, everybody, and thanks, Corey. Um, I have uh, a couple of questions. One's real quick. It goes back to what somebody, I think, um, I forget who, um, maybe Yvonne was asking about the uh, the boundaries between the biogeographic uh, zones, and I, I had a similar question for the for the depth zones. C can you just tell yeah. me, I, I think that the shelf is 200 meters and then the boundary between upper and lower slope is 700 fathoms, is, th is that what you used for those? Yeah, so this, the uh the upper zone uh, is, is the break's about 200 meters, um, and then the next break is at about 1,000 meters, um, as sort of um, sort of standard zones for the pelagic ecosystem, if that's what you're asking about. And then the, the shallowest is basically the depth of the photic zone within the near shore, and, that, <clears throat> and that's about 40 to 50 meters. Okay. Thanks. And then uh, these other questions are maybe a little bit more in-depth. Um, one is, uh, in terms of uh, um, benthic marine indicators, did you guys talk at all or have you looked at or considered or could you speculate on whether there might be something that could be worked up as an indicator based on um, bycatch of uh, biogenic habitat like corals and sponges, either based on observer data or, or uh, Fisherman's logbooks, or or both, and if not, could you speculate on whether there that might have some potential? Yeah, this is this is an ongoing question, which I've heard a lot about. Um, and and I, I should just say right off the bat that this is not my area of expertise. So um, if if somebody else has more experience, like um, Walter Wakefield on the call or something like that, that would this would be really valuable input. But um, my understanding is is that the bycatch is sufficiently a, uh, considered a, a poor indicator for a number of reasons of of what's on the bottom. For 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 starters, you're looking at what's been removed. Um, you're all, there's also a concern about sort of evidence of absence, and in the context of bycatch, um, the the gear is not particularly well designed for indicating absence, I, it's a very leaky system, and so your likelihood of, of maintaining a catch once you've caught it is fairly low. And so those are, those are just a couple concerns um, that, I, uh, that I think um, really highlight the um, reluctance uh, or reservations of some, some scientists for using uh, bycatch of corals for indicating um, the distribution of, of, of um, coral habitat, deep sea coral habitat. Um, I think th there are more, and if there are um, people on the call who would like to comment on that, I'd, I'd welcome it. Well, he hearing nothing, maybe I'll just ask my, uh, my last question, and if anyone else wants to chime in on that, they can kind of do it after. And this goes back to what I think uh, Larry was asking about um, in terms of 
tying indicators into the council process. When it comes to habitat indicators, have you guys thought at all about potential future evolution to tying some sort of reference points, um, like uh, thresholds or targets to any of yeah. the indicators? That was actually one of my questions I had on the list here, <laughs> but I took it out because I didn't actually say anything about reference points during the talk. But it's it's something that I'm very concerned about is, is what are these, uh, um, how do you calculate these reference points for habitat, and and uh, and, and what what levels should they be at? And um, I think that's um, just so we're we're within the context of the IE. We're just getting around to um, dealing with that. And um, I think in the next um, at webinar uh, by Jamil um, and um, Elliot Hazen, they they will talk about reference points to some extent. Oh, cool. All right. Thanks. Uh, Fred Turek, um, your hand is raised. Go ahead. I think you need to take your phone off mute on your end. Uh, while we're waiting for Fred, um, Jamil, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Great. I was just going to add to what Corey said and um, just briefly say that I think one way to think about reference points for habitat in the context of fisheries is to think about production functions. So how much habitat do you need to achieve a given um, level of fish production? And so there are very coarse and uh, quick and dirty ways to do that, and then there are much more detailed ways to do that through experimental observation, experiments and observations and so forth. So there's a range of approaches that could be used, and um, to me that seems like it would be a, a productive avenue of, of research and inquiry. Thanks, Jamil. Yeah, th this is Fred. Can you hear me now? Yeah, uh, going back to those re you know the reference points and also you know kind of tying it into the habitat uh, enhancement issues and stuff. I think you know knowing a reference point uh, of where those habitats are would be is a would be a very important uh, uh, indicator to have. Um, I know that uh, I. Struggled with that early on, in you know, in some of my uh, restoration activities in the Central Valley, mainly with knowing like what was I looking for, and right. I, you know, so I think that understanding, you know, I mean, where a reference point was, and just giving a, basically a, a gr kind of a grade of where it might be compared to something else, or so that you had a target idea of what you wanted to go for. I agree, and uh, I guess um, one one point that um, that brings up is sort of what the range of alternatives on our horizon are, and how conceivably we might be thinking about reference points uh, in the context of indicators from a, a relatively short time series, and so particularly for habitat where we have access to long-term historical records, so we understand at least the full range of what's um, of what's feasible for these sort of ecological conditions, um, those those data sets are valuable, really valuable for understand better understanding reference points. Yeah, it's it, it's not only valuable for in, you know for the idea of you know enhancing the habitat, but it's also valuable for let's say gear management um, right. with the idea of looking at what is more destructive than the other. Uh, I mean, I. I, I spent a period of my life also drag, you know, dragging, and um, when you were, you know, the question that you had about, you know, uh, using, you know, getting information from, you know, f from uh, fishermen, and I really doubt they give you that data with regard to, you know, uh, bycatch, uh, unless you had an observer on the boat. Yeah, some of these some of these historical data sets are, are perhaps more challenging than others, um, and it's, all of them have their. I mean, it, 
just acquiring the the information which you can observe uh, um, infer through a long time series with um, with strong um, resolution is, is tricky. Thank you. So uh, I'm not sure if we have any other questions. I did have a, a broad question, uh, maybe for Corey, but maybe also for Chris and Toby if they're on. Um, and then before we totally close, uh, I wanted to have a quick ecosystem work group chat about um, planning our report for the council. But uh, it sounds from Corey's presentation, and I think we sort of heard this theme on other presentations, that one of the bigger challenges is finding data sets or having data sets that cover a large geographic area. You might have really good data for some small areas and then no data for other sections of the coast. And so I'm just, is this, am I correct in thinking this is a general challenge and theme across indicator types? Yeah, I think this, that's uh, been a particular challenge from the habitat standpoint. And I'm, I, for others, uh, I, I would agree that depending upon your measurement, you're going you're gonna to have spatially scattered information. And so what do, what do you infer for the rest of the region based on these, these scatterings of information? Um, Deb, you have your hand up. Uh, thanks, Kit. I just wanted to see if anybody was wanted to follow up on that response to Yvonne before I said anything. But I guess hearing none, um, I just was curious. Um, I was thinking about I, I'm involved with a different activity where the idea of an indicator for something like um, harmful algal blooms came up. And I'm curious where things like that that are sort of new things but um, have potential um, impacts, where something like that comes up as um, whether you try and generate indicators for something like that or hope that it comes out of ones that you already have? Yeah, so that was one of the indicators that were reviewed uh, and um, definitely sort of um, one in which we, we thought was valuable, um, but I think that was where we had sort of some data constraints as well. And um, I, I mean that that might be something you want to bring to the fore if if um, from a ecosystem group perspective you think that's really important um, and so those um, I, I, that kind of information is welcome and uh, can help structure sort of where we prioritize our efforts going forward. And I had another question, and this may be just my uh, not being able to find things, but um, I did find the report that you had referenced, Corey, um, by Googling, as you had suggested, but uh, I'm sorry if this is um, an embarrassing question for my NOAA colleagues, but is there a general page for the California current IEA phase three stuff because <laughs> yes there is um, so the report is broken up into um, particular chapters and so I'm going back to the actual webs uh, web link that I provided so I think if um, you go through that and go to report or something like that that um, that would get you so um, that would get you the um, um, 2013 Phase Three report. Uh, um, is is um, Greg Williams on the line? Can you comment? 
Greg just stepped out, um, but uh, I should. Pro this is Chris Harvey. I should jump in here because uh, we're in the process, actually, of of, of uh, doing a uh, a website uh, overhaul. Uh, and right now, the version that's up there is still the old version. Which, um, you, Yvonne, you, we were embarrassed about this long before you said anything. So so don't worry about about that. Uh, if um, if you'd like, uh, I will. What's the easiest thing for me to do, Yvonne? Send you an email uh, with the link, or or walk people to it right now, or what? Um. Well, I think if if there's something that folks can look at, uh, then it would be great if the link could be up on the the uh, council's website for this webinar series. Um, yeah, how about? If Send you and that I, link, and then uh, you and Kit that link, and then it can be posted uh, okay. it over the phone. All right. Thank you so much. And again, I'm sorry for. <laughs> oh no. So, um, so this is something that we've been um, trying to work on in our spare time, and uh, and I think everybody knows how um, you know what the subtext of in our spare time is. Yeah, and and this this. Um, Accessibility on the web is is a sore spot for us. <laughs> so, I was, yeah, I was definitely going to mention that we're going to be updating this and making it a, a little easier to access. Okay. Do we have any other questions from members of the public, other advisory boards? Any last questions for Corey from members of the Ecosystem Work Group? This, this is Deb. I, I can always come up with another question. <laughs> so, so my question is, um, I know that in the CPS plan, um, one of the things they identify as EFH is based on sea surface temperature and thermocline mixture uh, uh, temperature in through the thermocline mix layers and so I'm just curious if you have contemplated or there's any way to to turn that into some sort of indicator uh, yeah very much so as a pelagic habitat indicator um, those are those are those those two ones right up on top for habitat quantity um, so the thermocline depth specifies the depth of which you have that thermocline so that indicates or the amount of um, habitat within a particular temperature range. That euphotic depth is really focused on the, that range that's exposed to light. So um, both of those are front and center for development up and coming. Thanks. Thumbs up. That would be great, Corey. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so I think uh, we will maybe, unless last last call for for substantive questions, we'll call an end to the interesting portion of the um, webinar and just have a quick discussion of um, amongst the ecosystem work group members as to uh, how we're going to get our act together on our report to the council. So. Um, and we will um, not be taking public comment on that because <laughs> 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 we're still not very organized on it. So, um, so any other public comment or questions before we um, start talking schedules? I'm not seeing any hands raised so far. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for attending, and thank you, Corey, for this uh, presentation. You had, uh, when I started to think about the four FMPs and the vast area that you were covering, it, it's a lot, and um, so I think it's going to take us a little while to get our brains around what habitat indicators may or may not be useful to the council versus other types of management challenges that we have throughout the area. Yeah, thanks. And, and thanks to everyone for listening in.